Shalom Aleichem. Es ich freue mich zu sehen, euch alle in Binion zu sehen. Es ist so schön, noch so viele Jahre zu haben Menschen da noch einmal. So, it, it's such a pleasure to have people in the building and to get to do a talk like this in person and not in Zoom, on Zoom. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're really pleased to get to share so, this project that we've been working on over the last several years. And as Susan said, next year by this time, it will be here for everybody to enjoy. Um, so it's a, it's a new core exhibit for the center, and the goal really is that anybody who walks in the doors will have an opportunity, whether they know nothing about Yiddish or whether they've loved Yiddish their whole lives, to uh, explore a really broad diversity of what modern Yiddish culture is and was, what is contained in all of the books on our shelves. So that's the, the core goal of this exhibit is to, in a different way, open up the books to people who come and visit the center so they can really understand something about this culture and its history. Um, we are, the way that we approach the exhibit, which we're gonna show you today, we don't try to give a kind of comprehensive history of Yiddish culture. We would need a much bigger museum in order to do that. So what we've chosen to do is to um, pick highlights, to pick interesting examples and intriguing stories about the people who created Yiddish culture, the people who consumed Yiddish culture, the key historical moments and places where the culture came from. And we show off examples of these uh, so that there's something new, both for people who know a lot about Yiddish and for people who don't know anything. Um, I think that, yeah, David, what else would you say about the kind of overarching goals of? Um, so I think, you know, like any exhibit, um, we're creating a visual experience. And so it has to really engage the intellect as well as the emotions. Uh, we want people to, to learn things, um, give, understand things in a maybe a deeper and more nuanced way, uh, but also obviously to, to sort of feel things. And, um, and that's often about personal stories and picking uh, examples of particular activists or writers or theatre personalities um, with uh, those, those really compelling um, individual stories. And as I think will become clear as we go through some of the, the sort of overview and <coughs> home in on some of the, the detail, um, We've, we've kept certain sort of principles in mind. I mean, there are, there are lots of them, but I think one that we both feel strongly about is that we want to put women at the center of this story of 150 years of modern Yiddish culture. You know, this is a story that's often told in terms of the uh, a sort of patriarchal line. So the classical um, trio of Yiddish writers, Mendel, Shalom Aleichem, and Peretz, and so it goes on with their protégés and, and their protégés. And it's, it's often, uh, especially in the older literature and, and surveys of Yiddish literature and culture, uh, it's really hard to find um, the women. And this is kind of absurd, as we know, because there, there are uh, women at every kind of level of, of this story um, as creators and as, especially as consumers, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's one of the sort of core principles that we've kept in mind as we go through. Um, I think we want to connect the past to the present um, as, I mean, you're all here at Yidstock. It's obvious to all of us that Yiddish culture is uh, in a process of being created all the time and especially in our present moment, mm -hmm. really, the last, the last several years. And as, as Mindel said, really, I think, um, thirdly and sort of finally, um, we really want to open up the books. You know, we, we walk around the shelves here and you see lots of gray and brown and dark. Um, spines facing you and first of all all those books many of them had had dust jackets that they've lost along the way right uh, but more you know more more importantly than that um, they are full of extraordinary stories that address every subject which is why people continually return to yiddish and younger students um, discover points of engagement and, and points that that are you know relevant to to their own lives in yiddish and so one of our key goals, I think, is to tell the story of the books and connect them also to the people who were reading them mm -hmm. and the way they've survived through the generations um, to come through to us. So 
We're going to give you a few examples, but we'll kind of start with an overview uh, to give you a sense of much of what we're going to cover, some of the different topics that we'll cover, and just how this really will transform um, the kind of public spaces of the center. So this is a bird's eye view looking down into the repository. We're sitting up here in the small theater today. Um, so the the We'll tell you a bit more about this. The exhibit's going to start with a newly commissioned artwork, a mural that we're calling Yiddish Lands, about Yiddish around the world. We'll show you some examples of that. Um, this, this end of the repository, right where you entered into the theater, will become largely focused on Yiddish literature. And we have several sections that will be displayed there on topics like um, how Yiddish helped to modernize Jews, how it was a language of modernization about the popular fiction in Yiddish, right? Yiddish wasn't just poetry and high literature. It was a lot of popular reading that people read in their day-to-day -day life. So we'll talk about the popular literature. Um, a focus on women writers, as David was just saying, will be one of the core sections here. A section on modernism, some of the really experimental things that were happening in Yiddish literature and in art that was visual art that was connected with the literature and a focus on um, Yiddish in the Soviet Union, right, which was a kind of place of great creativity and then also great oppression for Yiddish culture and whose story has been a little bit outside what we tend to learn about uh, in Yiddish. And I think that, that connects to what David was saying about a focus on women. You know, we're, we're looking in this exhibit to show some of the core history, some of the essentials of Yiddish culture but the study of Yiddish continues, right? Just like the enjoyment of Yiddish culture continues and the creation of Yiddish culture continues. People are learning new things and thinking about Yiddish in new ways. And we're engaging with a lot of that exciting scholarship in this exhibit. So putting women at the forefront, that's something that a number of scholars and translators and teachers are working on today. And also understanding you know, what Yiddish culture was created in the Soviet Union, even under the kind of difficult and repressive circumstances, that's something that people are, are focusing more on today. So we want to showcase some of that to expand some of the stories that we, we know about Yiddish. Um, We'll, we'll also tell you a bit more about some of the key collections that we're going to feature in addition to books, and those include a Yiddish typewriter collection uh, and a Yiddish print collection, right? So you're familiar with the wonderful linotype machine. That will become the kind of centerpiece of a larger display about the Yiddish press and newspapers and journals, uh, and we'll showcase a really amazing collection of, of Yiddish print font that we have of type that we have here in the center. Um, we'll also have displays about Yiddish and the Holocaust, of course, a kind of uh, essential historical moment for understanding Yiddish, both what was lost in the Holocaust and what people created in Yiddish to memorialize and to make sense of the experience of the Holocaust. Um, We'll have a display about Yiddish music. So you may be familiar with the sheet music collection. We're going to turn that into the kind of centerpiece of um, a display about different kinds of Yiddish music. And we'll have a large new display here in this space about the Yiddish theater, um, which David can tell you a bit more about. And there are other things. We'll talk about Yiddish after, after World War II and Yiddish today, as we spoke about. We'll talk about um, the different organizations and individuals who've helped to preserve Yiddish, that the Yiddish Book Center is one important part of a story, but a longer story about different efforts that have been made over the decades to preserve and share Yiddish. So did I leave out something big? That gives you a sense of some of the major kind of areas that we're hoping to touch on. We'll come on to yeah. this, but we have a, um, we, we will create a special new room um, up here that we'll talk about. But I think, you know, underpinning all of this is the message that Yiddish is um, perhaps not uniquely, but an extraordinarily global culture. And that, that was true, obviously, of, uh, you know, if we're looking at 150 years of modern Yiddish culture from the late 19th century through to the present moment, um, migration is at the core of the story of Yiddish culture, and it's at the the heart of the experience of writing and also of, of reading and consumption of literature and also consumption of, of the culture more broadly. 
So this was a common experience um, shared by pretty much everybody who, who had a role in the, the story of modern Yiddish culture. Um, and so many writers and theater personalities and creative figures um, you know, emigrated multiple times. They maybe left a shtetl uh, with their family as a child. They maybe studied if they were you know, exceptional in Munich or Vienna or Berlin or Paris. Um, they almost certainly moved continents at least once, often multiple times. And in, in certain cases, and actually more common um, with writers than one might think, they were global travelers really throughout their lives. And that was partly out of necessity. I mean, where was your audience as a speaker and as a cultural figure? It was in Buenos Aires, but it was also in Montreal. It was in Paris and Berlin, but it was also throughout the Russian Empire, but it was also in South Africa, right? And so it goes on and on and on. And so the, the sort of bigger names and the best known names traveled uh, in many cases, constantly, really, and, and would have been hard-pressed to say uh, what they considered home. So we'll, we'll, we'll sort of come on to that in yeah. more detail, I think. This is just a, a bit of a close-up of, of the literature section to give you a sense of how the space will feel. And, and just as David was speaking about Yiddish globally and how that's one of the organizing features, we'll give you our first example of some of the content of the exhibit, which is this newly commissioned mural that I mentioned. And you can see it represented in this image along the ramp that you walk down to come into the repository. And this is another sense. So uh, this was really a unique <laughs> project and kind of question that we got to pose of if we wanted to represent Yiddish around the world, Yiddish as a global culture, how would we do that? Um, we started with an initial list of say 200 or 300 places and people and topics that we'd like to show um, and we're told gently and then less gently by our <laughs> colleagues over the intervening months, like maybe 36, how about 36? So um, that's what it we... Really, it started with us being like sort of kids in a candy store. Yeah. And it's like, like choose your you know, 200 best moments and favorite personalities <laughs> and most surprising you know, things, phenomena. Um, and we could, have, we could have had way more than that, but we have whittled it down to 30 something. It's an extremely painful process that involved like agreements of, okay, if I give up this, promise me that one day there's something that I get to choose. Um, but so we did. Did I, did I promise? Did I? He didn't promise. I, I asked for the promise. I didn't get the promise. Um, so this, this artwork is still in development, so we're not showing you the whole thing, but we do have a couple of examples. But hopefully this gives you a sense of we, we have this kind of creative interpretation of the continents of the world. And we've picked out a real variety of places to show that Yiddish was created on every continent, um, different moments reaching back to the 17th century and up into the 21st century. Uh, again, making sure that women's roles are represented. Um, and it, was, it really was fun to try and think of surprising examples uh, of how we could represent Yiddish. The, the artist of this amazing artwork is Martin Hacke, a German artist who we discovered because he makes these playful maps of different places. So we picked out just two to, to give you examples of, and we'll, we'll tell you about one more component of this, but David, do you want to yeah, explain mean, there, what we... Yeah, I mean, really, you know, it's, it, it's really, uh, you know, if we were doing it again, we would probably come up with a different 36 um, right. sort of group, but um, some of them are, are more obvious and some of them are less obvious, and this, in a sense, is one of the more obvious moments that we could have chosen, um, which, which really marks the the sort of, in some sense, mythical and legendary birth of the Yiddish theater, because it certainly had a, had a sort of prehistory um, before 1876. But that is the date, and, and it's memorialized in monuments and on Goldfaden's tombstone and so on. When um, Goldfaden really um, claimed, in the same way that Jelly Roll Morton claimed to have invented jazz, um, Goldfaden claimed to have invented the Yiddish theater <laughs> single-handed. And, and in a sense, he was right. Um, he was, I mean, Goldfarten was a hustler. Uh, I, you know, he was uh, an extraordinary protean figure. I mean, how many of you have heard of Avram Goldfarten? 
less than half, which is so, so sad because he deserves to be up there with Theodore Herzl and, I don't know, Anne Frank and any, any other iconic figure of modern Jewish history. Um, a truly remarkable guy who started out as a, a yeshiva, a very, very traditional um, kid and teenager, went, went to yeshiva, born in Ukraine, what is now Ukraine, um, but, and put on productions as a yeshiva student in his seminary. Um, so he would round up his fellow students and they would put on, you know, these early biblical sketches and sort of Haskalah improving moral tales. And, and then he, he tried all sorts of things. He became an umbrella manufacturer. He ran failed businesses galore um, and ended up uh, really deciding he wanted to be an impresario and a theater director. And, I mean, there are so many stories of how he did this. And he would, he would sort of turn up in a, in a town with a couple of actors and they would maybe go and fit one of them with a costume at a local dressmaker or, or milliners and he would hear someone singing in the storeroom and he'd be like, who's that? That, that, could, be in, that could be somebody in my theater. And he'd ask the shop owner, who's that person? They would take him backstage, introduce him to a couple of 13 and 14 year old girls and he would say, I have to meet their parents. <laughs> and, and the parents would turn up with the kids at Goldfarden's hotel room and he looked like a prince, or like an emperor. He was inc impeccably, beautifully turned out always when he had no money. Um, and he would say, you know, I, I will take your child. Do they know Yiddish? Well, no, not a problem. I'll send them to my parents for six months. They'll learn Yiddish. <laughs> Uh, and then they'll come back and they'll be a star in my theater. And in a few years' time, you'll come and see them perform in New York. And, in, and actually, it happened that way often. So, yeah, the moment when Goldfarden creates the modern Yiddish theater in a sort of wine garden, beer, beer tavern in, in Romania, and then it goes on to become this mass entertainment rivaling uh, Broadway and, and so on. So that's just one, one yeah. iconic moment. And I would just say that, you know, this is one of the earlier moments that the map will show, so it gives us a chance to show that Yiddish culture is being created in the 19th century. We have a few earlier moments. And that a place like Yasi, Yash, Romania, is a, is a key place in Yiddish culture. And people might not, it might not necessarily be one of the cities that you would even think of, even though it's really a, a central city and an important center of Galician Yiddish culture especially. So one other example to give you some of the variety of, of things that we'll show. Um, this is an illustration of, of Rachel Auerbach, Rachel Auerbach, uh, in Warsaw in 1946 after the war. Auerbach was a, a member, one of the very few surviving members of the Oinig Shabbos project, which was the underground archive of the Warsaw ghetto um, run created by Emanuel Ringelblum. Uh, the Oinig Shabbos managed to bury a number of containers that contained all of this writing, personal life writing, by people who were living in the ghetto and their own recollections about what was happening. Um, she was one of the few people who survived and knew the locations of these and they were able to recover a number of these containers after the war. So this is another really different and very crucial moment in, in Yiddish cultural history, right? The, uh, recovery of these documents by people about their experiences in the ghetto. And of course, people were incredibly creative in the ghetto. That's one of the remarkable things, right? People were putting on theater th the entire time and writing poetry and writing memoir and teaching school. And these documents tell those stories. So one other piece of the um, of this project is a, is a selection of books. So do you want to show yeah. a couple of the... We'll just pass some around. So along, so to complement the mural, as you can see at the bottom of the, of the illustration, um, we will show a selection of several dozen um, books that really speak to our central theme, which is the global nature of Yiddish. And I will pass them around. So just um, feel free, please don't take them out of the plastic, but look at them. And if any, I'm going to ask you in a minute, does anyone know what this book is? But just pass them around. Um, and this is, this is Hitler's Geburt, Hitler's Birthplace by my great-grandfather, Sholomash. This is a book about Uzbekistan. So we'll start in the four corners and, and just please share them around. This is Yidden in Spanish and Krieg, Jews in the Spanish War, the Civil War, 36 to 39. 
Jews, Jews were very prominent in the, um, in the, in the fighting on the, um, on the radical sides, of course. Schwarz und Weiss, Black and White, by Rachmiel Feldman, a South African writer, Stories of Race in South Africa. And so it goes on. So we, we'll, choose, we'll choose books for this selection that speak to dozens of different places um, and give a sense of the extraordinary breadth of, and variety of this literature. Uh, I don't, this is a book I don't think we'll be able to show because it's too big. This is Sibir, Siberia by Avram Sutskova, um, a poem inspired by his childhood uh, in Siberia before he um, returned to Vilna and, and then on obviously to Israel after the war. Um, and these will just be a kind of snapshot of um, the idea of global Yiddish, all right? So where is the book with the, the, mystery, the mystery cover and, okay, can you just hold it up? All right, anyone think what that might be, this book that has... You're on the right track. I've cheated. It does say... Oh, oh <laughs> don't, don't... Shh, shh, shh. All right, don't look at the spine. Um, <laughs> anyone who hasn't cheated, what might it be? Okay. Is that cheating, or is it like doing good, proper research? Yes. <laughs> Using, yeah. <laughs> yes. Anne Frank's Diary. It is Anne Frank's Diary of Yiddish. It is one of, I think, three translations done in the 1950s. This one is a Buenos Aires. Um, publication, but there were also uh, there was also a Warsaw and an Israeli publication. Three different versions of Anne Frank's diary in Yiddish. All right, so that's really those two elements: the mural and the books are are the sort of introduction to our theme of Yiddish as a global cultural phenomenon. So next, we're going to show. Um, We've spoken about it a bit, but we're going to show what one of these literature sections will look like in a bit more detail and a few more examples of some of the objects that will be displayed. And it's our display on women writers. Um, so, as David mentioned, this is a real focus for us, right? The, the idea is not that we talk about women writers in one section and then we've done our job and we can go back to talking about the great men who really created the culture. Uh, We've made sure to show, to show women's contributions throughout the exhibit, and, and as I said, we're benefiting from a lot of really contemporary research um, to kind of undo some of the easy narratives that we have of is, it's easy to tell men's stories because some of them were very good at telling their own stories, and meanwhile, say in the Yiddish press, the women journalists were kind of churning out their stories and making sure that the columns got filled. So, so we're showing more of those stories. But in this section, we get to focus on some of the excellent women writers, but also what their experience was. Why is it that we know fewer of these women writers? Um, why are there less of their books on the shelves? Not because they wrote less, but because they faced material challenges to getting their work printed in book form, for one example. So we're telling a bit of that story of what was it really like to be a woman writer in this male-dominated environment, what, who are some of the women writers, that's what this section is, um, some of the relationships that existed among women writers, so even though they're working in a male-dominated environment and we often see them kind of depicted as one lone woman in a group of men, women of course built relationships and supported each other and responded to each other's writing, so we'll show some of those stories. Uh, and we'll show some of the, you know, unique examples of, of recognition of women's work that, that did exist earlier on. So a very well-known anthology of women's writing from the 1920s that presented women writers over 500 years at that point. Um, so David has three more kind of key artifacts to show you some of, actually these will be displayed in a, in a separate section, um, but some of the, the books from our collection that we get to highlight uh, that, that show women's contributions even though they've been left out of college syllabi or anthologies uh, until recently. Yeah, so um, have any of you read this, Diary of a Lonely Girl? Yes, two hands, three hands. Book club members, well, it will book be familiar. <laughs> oh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> um, 
So, um, a book by a writer called Miriam Karpilov, who was very well known um, in Yiddish literary circles as a journalist, a working journalist, and a story writer. Um, but like a lot of these early women writers of the 1900s, uh, who sort of came of age in the 1900s and 1910s, it was extremely hard for them to get their books published. So their work would appear in newspapers, in journals, in periodicals. Um, but by this stage, you had collected works of Sholem Aleichem and Mendeler and Peretz and people like my great-grandfather, Sholem Ash, had churned out dozens of published books. Um, but this I actually did, not did sorry, to, I did a count of this. I went through our digital library mm -hmm. to check how many authors have collected works in Yiddish. I found that over 60 male authors have collected works, and many of those are more than 10 volumes. They have 10 volume plus collected works. There are three or four women writers who have a collected works, and it's only ever one volume. So yeah. 60 with 10 volumes or more, and four, never yes. more than one. It's really <laughs> striking. I mean, I have a shelf of my great-grandfather's books, and it's, it's that wide. It's at least 24 volumes. Um, so I have been wanting to find the Yiddish version of Diary of a Lonely Girl for the longest time. And since I started working here in September 2017, I had not seen the book come in. And a few months ago, it was as the pandemic was easing, um, a couple turned up with two boxes of books unannounced at the front desk, and we came down to the big table just outside here and opened up the first box, and right at the top was the diary of a lonely girl <laughs> in Yiddish. Togbuch, das Togbuch von ein elender Mädel by Miriam Karpilov, and it has this wonderful pictorial cover. Uh, and this is, I think it's 1917, Mindel, is mm -hmm. it? Something I like think that. that sounds right. Um, somewhat earlier, you had Sarah Raisin's first book of poetry, 1911, in, in Vilna. And somewhat earlier than that, a year or two earlier, one of the rarest of the rare um, Yiddish books, which is uh, a fictionalized memoir, Kinder Jorgen, by Rochel Feigenberg. These are all very considerable writers, uh, very well known in the literary establishment, well known in circles in Warsaw, Vilna, Kiev, Berlin, and so on. But um, this was a moment when they start having their books published in book form, and it's really 1910 to 1920 that it picks, picks up. But as Mindel says, even after that, yeah. um, there were, you know, nobody was putting out collected editions of their work. So it's, it's a very striking contrast between the, the sort of struggles they faced as literary activists and operators um, in a heavily male environment and how it was for their male counterparts. I mean, Sarah Raisin had two very well-known brothers, Avram and Zalman, extremely um, big figures in, in Yiddish uh, literature and culture. And she would, she, they would expect her basically to run around and do, do their literary business for her, uh, you know, in the cities where she happened to find herself. And she did it somewhat reluctantly. And there's some great letters back and forth between them. Um, but uh, you know, Avram Raisin's works are on the shelves in multiple volumes. And I think Sarah Raisin published two or possibly three slim volumes in the course of her life. And, and that's that's how it goes. And it, it's. Um you know, in this section, we'll get to showcase some of the research, right, that's making this work more accessible. And, and Jessica Kurzain's translation is a good example. But it also is a understanding um, how few of those collected works there were is a really material explanation for why we have less translations of their work. You can't pull the book off the shelf. You can't download it from the Spielberg Library. You still have to go into a newspaper archive and a microfiche machine or you know, the, some of the Yiddish papers that have been digitized and scroll through these very hard to read pages to find the work. So it's materially still much more difficult to find these writing. But um, people have attended some of our, our programs with um, researchers like Anita Norwich, right? She's one of the people who's sitting there at the microfiche machine and scrolling through and, and extracting whole novels that, that women wrote that were never published in book form. So next we wanted to show you um, a section of the exhibit that, that gets to showcase some of our collection that are not books. Um, so over the years, 
intentionally and less intentionally, we have acquired collections in addition to the Yiddish books. And one of the, one of the fascinating ones is a collection of Yiddish typewriters that people have donated their Yiddish typewriters over the years. Um, and we've never really had occasion to do much with them. But in the last number of years, um, some of our intrepid uh, graduate fellows who come and work at the center undertook projects to first find all of the machines around the building, because lots of people like to have them in their office since they look so good. Find them, see how many there are, um, recover the story of where they came from. We located people to clean and identify the machines. They did research. They found um, advertisements from the press from when the machines were new about how they were used. And so now we have this Maybe, the, maybe likely the largest collection of Yiddish typewriters in the world is here. Uh, over 30... 40, currently 40. We, ju we reached 40 a month or two ago when Krista, um, right. who runs the oral history program, kindly brought back Malka Heifetz Tussman, a very considerable poet, her typewriter from California that had passed into the hands of one of her uh, students who had kept it and we were made aware that it was available and so that is now number 40 in our ever-growing collection. So s several of the machines belong to well-known writers, um, including the, the linguist Mordechai Schechter, his machine is here, uh, and probably the most prestigious of all of the stories of typewriters that we have, we have up here to show you, which David is very excited that he found a cloth um, to... Yeah. Cover. Well, Lisa, Lisa found the cloth, but I, I've always wanted to have a black cloth moment, so here we go. Um, so, anyone care to guess whose typewriter this is? That could be valued above all other typewriters here at the Yiddish Book Center. <laughs> it's Aaron. It's someone, someone said it. No, not my great-grandfather, Aaron Lansky, although someone did yesterday call me David Lansky. But anyway. um, this is Aaron Lansky's typewriter. <laughs> And it is the typewriter on which Aaron wrote what is now called Aaron's Thesis. Right, <laughs> this is it. Uh, this is what he used to type the Yiddish quotations in his thesis about Mendel and Mochus for him. And um, this, this was not that easy to find, I think, because it languished in Aaron's garage somewhere for many years. Um, he bought it, it says in our records, in 1978, and it dates back to the, the mid-1940s. So he used it as a student. It was his working typewriter, and so we're delighted that that will be on show in the typewriter uh, section alongside many other um, interesting machines with interesting stories. Okay, so I think that you get to do your second reveal. We're going to... Um tell you about one more, ob one more object. So Great. one okay. more kind of unusual object, All not right. a book, that will be featured. So. <laughs> you get to test how dedicated readers of Pock and Trigger, the audience, are if they recognize this or not. <laughs> so um, uh, I, I knew a lot of stories about my great-grandfather, Sholomas, from my grandmother. And I knew that he was, I had a sense who his close friends were in the literary community. Um, and there were, there were a number of them. He also had definitely enemies as well, so I knew who they were. Um, but one of his close friends was the writer Peretz Hirschbein. And they were exact contemporaries. They're both born in 1880. They were both literary celebrities. They both traveled the world a lot. They were both theater pioneers in sort of Yiddish art theater in the 1900s. So they kind of caught up with each other at intervals in New York in the 20s, um, in France, in Poland. Uh, and then in uh, 1939, my great-grandfather, who'd been living in France for 15 years, um, got out just before the war and came back to America and spent the next 15, 12, no, 12, 13 years in America. Um, moved into a house in Stamford, Connecticut in, in about 1940. Um, you, you, are you from there? Oh, okay. Okay, great. So, so um, all this I knew. Um, and some, quite recently actually, I got in touch on Facebook with Peretz Hirschbein, not, not the recreated um, writer, but his grandson, also called Peretz Hirschbein. 
and, and we just started chatting, and I said, um, uh, you know, do you have anything connected to my great-grandfather still surviving in the family? And he said, well, of course, there's the medicine ball. I said, medicine ball? He said, you must know the story of the medicine ball. I, I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, well, as a kid, I grew up playing with this medicine ball because your great-grandfather had given it to my father. So the story is that in 1941 or two, Hirschbein was at that point really dying from a degenerative illness, beginning his decline. And he and his wife, Esther Schumacher, a, a poet, a Yiddish poet, came east from their home in Hollywood to New York to find doctors who might be able to help with his, his recovery. And while they did that, they parked their son, Omas Hirschbein, with my great-grandparents in Stamford, Connecticut, on Sky Meadow Drive. Um, and the kid was like seven years old. He was sort of thin, a weedy kid. My great-grandfather, actually both Ash and Hirschbein were into sort of physical, proud of their physicality and sportsmen and so on. And Ash evidently sort of took one look at the boy and said, I have to sort of strengthen you. Um, and they began to play this ball back and forth. Anyway, so the week goes by and the kid falls in love with the ball and he says to my great-grandfather, Sholem, when I leave, when mum and dad come and pick me up, could I take the medicine ball with me? And my great-grandfather, who was expansive and capable of sort of grand gestures and so on, a dunk, a shenum dunk, said, um, of course, it's yours, you'll take it when you leave. The moment comes, and he asks for the ball, and Ash says, oi. <laughs> Actually, I want to read you, let me read you Here. exactly exactly how it transpired, because Jessica, um, Peret Sershbein's mother, told me the story, and it's, it's much nicer if I read it you, so the story of what exactly happened. Uh, almost was seven or eight, he, um, Ash was wonderful with him, he had this heavy medicine ball, promised when the time came for him to leave, he could take it with him. Evidently, Ash said, nein, nein, dos bleib do, the ball stays here. Upon which his wife, Maja, my great-grandmother, said, shame on you, Shulamshi. You told him it was his, so it belongs to him now, not to you. Then Ash said, But Maja, Chobes Zoy Lieb, Chmuses Hoben. I like it so much, I have to have it. So she said, All right, I'll buy you another one. <laughs> and he said, But I like this one. <laughs> and this is all related to me by, by you know, um, the, the widow of the boy. Um, and then she told him not to be such a baby. And so when Omas left, he took the medicine ball with him, and it's been in our closet ever since. It's one of our favorite family stories. And by the way, Esther, this is Peretz Hirschbein's wife, Esther Schumiacher, Esther always used to say that Maja was terrific, and she had to be, because of all her children, Sholem was the biggest child of all. <laughs> <laughs> and that is true. <laughs> that was my great-grandfather. Um, so that is the story of the medicine ball, and then Lisa, are you here somewhere still? Lisa yeah. at the back. Lisa and I drove to New York, when was it? <laughs> Two, three years ago? During the pandemic? Beginning of the pandemic. Beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> we met Jessica Hirschbein on the sidewalk of Riverside Drive and 106th Street, I think, and she handed over the ball, and it's going to be in the exhibit. And so there it is, from a closet on the Upper West Side, for however many decades, uh, it'll be featured in our exhibit with this wonderful story of how Ash reluctantly was persuaded to part with his favorite medicine ball. So there you have the real story of the whole reason for the exhibit is so that David had an excuse to get the family medicine ball back. So and, and we will also display uh, the travel trunk, the steamer trunk that Peretz and Esther traveled with around the world twice from 1918 when they married to 1930 when they settled back in New York. And they were extraordinary immersive travelers. They spent six months on an ashram in India. They went to China, Japan, New Zealand. I mean, they, they literally went around the world twice, mm. uh, writing travel journalism as they went. Um, and again, the trunk stayed in Jessica's closet on the Upper West Side mm -hmm. ever since. And you will be able to see it in a year's time with the story of their travels and some souvenirs they brought back with them. Thanks very much, Dank. Grüezi Dank.
Hello, hello. Um, thank you. It's very fun to watch that back because I think it's keeps going and evolving and becoming bigger and bigger and more exciting. So great to share this with everybody. Um, so uh, we have a couple yeah, one of, of the, questions. One, one, of yeah. the, one of the challenges is that, as you know, you know, as we're in the sort of end game of putting this all together, stuff keeps coming in and keeps coming in and it's all I have some of it around me we'll maybe get to it but it's you know it's it's wonderful and it it all kind of screams I want to be in the exhibit and and you know it's the show's kind of over at this point um but anyway so so um, it's, it's no it's <laughs> never <laughs> over no you're very persuasive we'll find pigeonholes for it people don't worry there'll be plenty to see um plan to spend a couple of days um, going through. Um, so we have a couple of questions. Um, one is, how is a Yiddish typewriter different than a Hebrew typewriter? Ah, um, not, not, a, not a huge deal of difference. And come to the exhibit and we'll tell you exactly how. But a lot of, um, a lot of Yiddish writers and people writing in Yiddish used Hebrew typewriters because essentially um, the, the differences are small to do with vowels and certain letters. Um, but you you can absolutely write Yiddish on a Hebrew typewriter. Uh, and you have to look reasonably closely to spot the differences. Um, so Yiddish typewriters were made, you know, as proper Yiddish typewriters, but Hebrew typewriters at a certain point were being made in greater quantities. And so we have some Hebrew typewriters in our collection that were being used as Yiddish typewriters. That's the short version. Uh, somebody is asking, how hard has it been for you to come up with sort of the overarching themes, I think is what they're asking, um, for the exhibit? Yeah, it's very hard. Um, and it's a constant kind of juggling process. You know, oh, we haven't said anything about Isaac Bashevis Singer. We better find some way of talking about Isaac Bashevis Singer or, you know, in, in a myriad ways. Um, it's it's hard, but we're coming at it from a number of different angles. Some are quite specific, like the the wonderful story of the Hirschbein's trunk and their travels, uh, you know, which puts them on a sort of par and Peretz Hirschbein as a travel writer, you know, in line with people like Hemingway and and Ilya Ehrenberg in the in the Soviet Union. You know, they they saw themselves in that sort of mold and so one of the things we want to do and the reason partly apart from the fact that the trunk is extraordinarily beautiful and Jessica has been incredibly generous and made wonderful souvenirs available um but one of the you know the the, the reasons for showing it is that we want to get out of this way of thinking that Yiddish is somehow you know marginal and cute and and all these stereotypes that people have and so you know you present the trunk and the sort of stories that Hirschbein was writing and the extremely vivid poetry that Esther was writing about geishas and about uh, Maori women and all sorts of themes. And, you know, these are incredibly sophisticated cosmopolitan people. Uh, and that's one of the, 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 you know, there are a number of sort of prisms through which we're, we're viewing this. And that's a key one to show um, Yiddish creativity as kind of central, so to bring it out of the margins, to, to sort of recenter Yiddish as um, a 19th and 20th century modern story. Uh, this participant wants to thank you and Mindel for the presentation, and also is eager to hear, having been at the center and seen your existing exhibit, what can you talk about in terms of how much more expansive and how does it build on what the work you're doing is all about? I mean, it's it's greatly going to expand um, what we're showing here at present um, in all sorts of ways. I mean, there'll be a lot of real objects. We, we gave you a bit of a hint in that presentation, but there'll be many, many more. Um, there'll be a big section about Yiddish theatre. Uh, we have nothing really about Yiddish theatre at the moment. Um, there'll be audio playlists, specially curated audio playlists. Uh, we'll recreate the whole room of the Peretz salon experience in 1900s Warsaw. So you'll step through a doorway into a room and be surrounded by the voices of some of the dozens, probably hundreds of young 
uh, men and women writers who had that experience, a formative experience in their own um, journey to becoming writers. And we'll have a wall with a representative selection of the Perret Circle. You know, these are kids of, of around 18, 19, 20, early 20s. And one of the things that struck me uh, when I came to the center and really looked around and, and got a grip on the exhibits was there weren't really that many young people on show. Uh, and th there are good reasons for that, like, that a lot of writers didn't have many pictures taken of them in their teens and early 20s. I mean, they were they were penniless in many cases. So they, they had pictures taken of them when they were in their 50s, 60s, 70s and 80s. But that's not the energy that created modern Yiddish culture. It was a radical counterculture, um, defiant, rebellious spirit. You defied parents, you defied your community, you defied you know, people on all sorts of levels to become a Yiddish writer. And so that sort of youthful face is something uh, that's, that's really, we've worked hard to show. Um, so oh, I forgot what the question was. Oh yeah, how will it <laughs> <laughs> how will it change? Oh well, let me show you a way that it'll change. So we have some story cases with books at the moment called Unquiet Pages, and it tells the story of Yiddish literature through books in cases. We're going to keep the cases, but each one is going to be its own uh, self-contained story. And here's something that's going to go into one of them. I have to be very careful how I hold it up. Now you can see it's got a, a shiny front and then the rest is not shiny. This is a fragment um, of the, the granite facade of the Amir building in Buenos Aires that was bombed in, uh, was it 1994? Um, and this, um, and it says fragment of facade of Amir building, uh, bombed July 18th, 1994. This was um, loaned to us very generously by Zachary Baker, the wonderful scholar and li librarian. Zachary went over to Buenos Aires to investigate the aftermath and specifically the effects of the bombing on the Buenos Aires branch of Evo. And so why do we have a story about this? Why is this an exhibit that has a place in, in our sort of big uh, new exhibit? Because it tells the story about the fragility and the frailty of Yiddish archives, which is something obviously very close to our hearts, but it, it tells it through this extraordinary object. I mean, maybe there are other fragments that survive, um, but it brings home to you just the uh, what was lost in that bombing, which was a huge amount of um, precious archives about Argentinian Yiddish going back to the colonies of the 1890s and 1900s, Yiddish theater archives, literary archives. Um, a lot was salvaged, but equally a lot was lost. And so we'll tell that story uh, in microcosm in this one case, and there'll be 16 of these. Uh, particular cases, the medicine ball that we showed in that film will be its own case, and there'll be uh, other objects in their own cases. So that's just one way where, you know, we're, we're sort of creating a texture to the exhibit with some big themes, some specific um, objects with stories around them, and, and some specially commissioned uh, things like the audio playlists and so on. And And I can assure all of you out there, it's really expansive. It will take over what those of you who have visited and been in the repository um, have seen before. Uh, question, what kinds of nonfiction works will you show? When I visited the center a few years ago, I remember seeing the DARUS Citizenship Guide in Yiddish and was really surprised to see that. Yep, great question. And we're showing, uh, we have a whole section about citizenship manuals and evening class manuals and all the ways in which Yiddish was a vehicle for naturalization and, and acculturation. Um, so that is definitely in there. We're showing um, some key works of, of Yiddish reportage and journalism from the 1930s. Um, the wonderful Polish journalist, um, Shin Schneiderman, who was a sort of roving reporter and was on the front line in the Spanish Civil War, wrote, wrote the book. I, I don't think it's the one we showed in that presentation, but it's another one. Um, with photographs by um, by his brother-in-law, Shim, David Seymour, one of the founders of Magnum Press, a really acclaimed, celebrated photographer. Um, so again, you know, you might not think of a Yiddish book about the Spanish Civil War as containing some really iconic uh, works of modern photography, but it does. 
Uh, alongside it, we'll show the story of uh, a really defining work about the Ukrainian famine of the 1930s. Um, this is a book by Mendel Osharovich, who was on the staff of the Forwards. Uh, we mentioned Lebanon in Soviet Rusland, how people live in the Soviet Union. He went, he was sent by the forwards really to report on the great uh, glorious Bolshevik revolution, which was a sort of lingering feeling in, in the editorial offices at the forwards and actually found himself there just as um, the famine, uh, you know, one of the worst, possibly the worst um, state directed famine in human history, um, the Holodomor was kind of taking grip in Ukraine. And not only was he reporting on it, but he was fluent in Yiddish, Ukrainian, and Russian. He was speaking to his relatives, some of whom were KGB officers. Um, he was, uh, and he was devastated, having not been back for 20 years, to find what was happening in his homeland. So it's, it's sort of incredibly raw and personal, uh, and a book that Ukrainian scholars are rediscovering as a sort of key work of, of reporting that catastrophe. So uh, there's a lot of nonfiction in the exhibit in many different ways. Um, is music a part of this exhibit? Music is a part of this exhibit. Uh, a big part of it I have, the wonderful sheet music here. Uh, Bar <laughs> that Kaufman wasn't by... a setup. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke about Goldfaden in that presentation. This is the Hebrew Publishing Company's 1900 nine um, beautiful um, series of songs from Bar Kochba. Um, but Bar Kochba is kind of facet of Goldfaden biblical operetta. So it's a piece of sheet music, but what does it tell us? This is a work that premiered in 1883 in Russia, just as this, this wave of pogroms in, of the 1880s were sweeping across Southern Russia. Goldfaden writes a play that puts Jews armed, rebelling against the Romans, on stage in, and this was played all over the shtetls and in big theaters in places like Odessa uh, and, and came very quickly to London and New York and Buenos Aires and so on. So there's, there's an incredibly empowering message here that people obviously took away from it. It's a message about standing up to oppression. Uh, and so Yiddish theater gets banned in Russia in the 1880s for precisely those kind of reasons. So it's not just a song sheet. It's emblematic of Goldfaden's incredible influence uh, on his time um, as a sort of educator, as a kind of history teacher, as a commentator, uh, as a nationalist. Um, and so, you know, it's full of the story of Bar Kokhba has all those associations. And, and those are, you know, we're trying to tell stories that are that speak to some of these key themes of modern Jewish history and the objects that we're featuring kind of have to do that work as well. How will you display Yiddish scripts and plays? Um, how will we just, there'll be a lot of Yiddish um, throughout the exhibit. I mean, we're limited in, in first of all, what we, what we have in terms of, of, we have play scripts obviously in the collection here. Um, uh, but you know, we'll we'll show a lot of photographs of certain things. There'll be books you can you can um, handle and and pick up and look through. This is one of them. This is a sort of uh, a tombstone sized book, and deliberately so because this is um, a volume of the Yiddish theatre lexicon um, that contains biographies of actors who were murdered in the Holocaust. It's volume five of a six volume work. It has five hundred and sixteen capsule biographies. So it looks like this. Um, little little photographs for some of them, long entries for some. Um, it's a work that's very close to my heart for, for lots of reasons, um, and not least because one of those 516 people is this man here. Can you see that, Lisa? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, so the, the baby is somebody I knew well uh, and was a dear friend of mine in London, got to know him in the 1980s, an actor called Harry Ariel. And this is his super proud father, uh, Chaim Dovid Ariel. They were a poor family from Lodge, but the whole family were in Yiddish theater. And um, 
I want to have a section in the theater display that's a kind of um, memorial, Holocaust memorial section. There, there are extraordinary photos in the Ghetto Fighters Museum in Israel um, from all brought out by one actor who collected them in Poland in the 1930s and turned out to be a sort of memorial um, collection. Uh, and so, you know, the, Chaim Dovid is one of them. But what happens to Harry? Harry survives the war. Uh, in the Soviet Union, he digs peat in a labor camp, his, kind of, his lungs are shot for the rest of his life, um, but he comes out and he, he arrives at a DP camp in Austria in the 19, mid 40s and creates, um, I'll just hold it up, this is the DP camp album that he creates with his photos that he, he didn't have any children, he left me a lot of his, his stuff. And it's an extraordinary album, and so it sort of connects his father's story to the DP camp theater story, the whole story of Yiddish creativity in DP camps. Uh, and so I will put this happily, kind of donate this to the exhibit, and this will be on show. You can see Harry's DP camp album. He was an amazing artist. He did all the scenic backdrops in the London Yiddish theater post-war. Uh, and so, you know, this tells a sort of extraordinary story through his his own family um that i'm just remembering the question doesn't exactly answer <laughs> your question but it, it, it gives you a different answer um but again it's you know it's a story about what happened to yiddish in the holocaust specifically the theater which was obviously you know put an end to any sort of bedrock heartland um, Yiddish community that sort of seeded other Yiddish theater communities around the world, that was never going to happen in the same way. Again, Yiddish theater, of course, carried on through actors like Harry today and theaters in a different way. Um, but, the, but there was sort of resilience of the theater community in the DP camps and afterwards is just totally astonishing um, with such meager resources. You know, there was incredible thirst for theater amongst the survivors and of course for actors that was what they knew and so they re recreated whole plays from memory uh, actually harry told me once he was banned from theaters as a seven-year-old because his parents would send him uh, into the theaters in lodge he had a photographic memory um, and he could watch a play come home and literally tell it to his parents who would write it out and they would have a play they could put on and when the other actors Got to find out about this they were of course angry and outraged and they banned him from coming into their theaters as a kid um so he's a really wonderful remarkable brilliant character uh, who i really loved and so it's you know it's for me it's lovely to be able to sort of have these kind of personal tributes in a sense to people i care deeply about uh, at different points in the exhibit uh, also and for the rest of us these stories are just amazing um I will back up and say the question was about music. And if I can say, yes, music will be included. And maybe you can give a quick nod to that. And then we'll go on. A lot of other people have questions about their favorite aspects of Yiddish culture. Yeah, we, you know, we have this extraordinary collection of Yiddish sheet music. We will, we will still have it in the racks that you can come and you browse it and you can buy it for a few dollars, a, a piece of sheet music that will still be there. We'll add into it. These PlayStations will add into it a layer of, photographs and varied images of all sorts, um, all types of Yiddish music and song. Uh, and it comes into the exhibit in different ways as well. You know, we're not, I mean, the, the section on women writers is a very specific section about the experience of being a woman in a heavily male uh, literary culture that, that really tightly controlled the editorial boards and newspaper editorial offices and so on. Um, but women writers and women creators feature right throughout the exhibit. Uh, and so, so it is a sort of across the board, music features in different ways in, in a number of different sections. I'm fascinated by the Yiddish Argentine tango world. Will there be a place for this sphere? <laughs> ah, uh, yeah, the wonderful world of Argentine Yiddish tango. Um, and one of the, the sort of icons, the pictograms on the, the ramp will feature Hevel Katz, this kind of troubadour who was a Polish immigrant to Argentina who, who sort of creates this Spanish Yiddish patois, which, which is hilariously funny uh, if you know both languages, which, you know, I don't, but I can sort of get a sense of how funny it is. Uh, but he was really beloved uh, for his sense of humor and his kind of take on, on this hybrid 
uh, Argentine Yiddish life, uh, died very young, had an enormous turnout at his funeral. He's there on that uh, wall as one of those 35 figures, along with Paul Robeson, along with Avram Goldfarden, along with um, all sorts of other people. Uh, so yes, we, we do nod to that. Uh, how about Yiddish cookbooks? Ah, yes, there will be at least one Yiddish cookbook. <laughs> Not enough, but, uh, uh, but yeah, there are some extraordinary Yiddish cookbooks. Uh, we have some in our collection um, and we will feature, we will feature them, yes. I'm going to make this the last question because I know you have to get back to working on the exhibit um, at, the, at the late hour. Um, but uh, this is, you know, obviously watching this, your enthusiasm for all of this is very apparent. Can you touch on the idea of what some of the challenges were and if you had a favorite part of the exhibit? Oh, I think, yeah, I, I well, it's hard to pick just one. The Peretz Room, I, I think, will be one of my favorite parts of the exhibit. Um, it's something I put a lot of time into trying to, um, it's, it's easy to understand who are the sort of central figures of the Peretz Circle there, you know, Raisin Nomberg, my great grandfather, Lamed Shapiro, some of these sort of celebrated writers, but there were actually a lot of women in it and you read much less about them. So I wanted to be sure not only to acknowledge that, but to feature pictures of them. And that's one of the challenges. So that speaks to the other part of the question, which is, you know, someone like Salome Pearl, very interesting writer who's recently been translated by Ruth Murphy beautifully. Um, there is no usable photograph that we were able to find of her. So you can't put her on the wall in a picture gallery with other writers. Um, Chava Shapiro, another Hebrew Yiddish writer who was a key part of that circle. Um, that that's we, we did better there. Um, Regina Liliantova, a very interesting Polish. Uh, ethnographer who was part of the circle, her granddaughter uh, in Warsaw was very helpful and sent us photographs of her. So, you know, in different ways, we've sort of teased out a lot of these stories, but but that's one of the difficulties with Yiddish. Um, you know, it was, it was a, a sort of, um, it, it didn't have the academies and it didn't have the, the Library of Congress that collected, I mean, mm -hmm. it has the Evo that did an extraordinary and does an extraordinary job of collecting the archives, but it's, it was haphazard as to what survived. And so that's really one of the challenges. You might want to show somebody, but actually, you know, the picture doesn't exist or we can't get it. Um, but but what my favorite parts, the Peretz room, the Hirschbein trunk and all the memorabilia uh, that will that will surround it, wonderful souvenirs from China and India and Japan and Tibet and so on. Um, the Yiddish theater section that I'm working on with my great friend and a good friend of the center, Carida Bryan, um, I think will be will be a lovely place to be in and you'll be able to hear a lot of songs. Um, and and others i can't just yeah i can't i can't just have one fair enough and as i uh, you and Mindel alluded to in the program there were a lot of things on your collective list um that you had to whittle down um thank you david for this and for all of your other work it's so exciting again for everybody out there yiddish a global culture we're excited to share that it opens on october 15th 2023 here at the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts. Watch for more information, watch yeah, for do, teasers, do, and also come, keep... come and, and we'll show come you and around. See us. Yes. Yes, it'll be a pleasure to actually have people, you know, looking at the exhibits and be able to have the conversations that, that they spark and learn from uh, all of you as you come, which is something that happens here the whole time. And, and the one thing you didn't touch on, which is there are interactives, there's audio, there's video. It's a rich, rich museum exhibit. So thanks again. Um, and all of you out there, please stay tuned, keep in touch on all of this as we roll out and tease out more about this exhibit. I want to thank David for joining me tonight. Um, thanks to our producer, Elizabeth Carteropoli, always for her hard work behind the scenes. Tonight's program is part of an ongoing series of programs, as I like to say, brought to you live from the Yiddish Book Center.
Please join us February 2nd at 7 p.m. for Belonging and Betrayal, How Jews Made the Art World Modern with author Charles Delheim. To see the full schedule of events and to register for our programs, visit YiddishBookCenter.org events. And before I let you go, a huge thanks to all of our members who make all of our ongoing work possible. Please learn how you can join or add further support by visiting yiddishbookcenter.org slash donate. Thanks again for joining us and look forward to seeing you next Thursday evening. Take care.